you. Thank you, Karen, for inviting me. Thank you to the Empiricist League. Um, I love the idea of an Empiricist League. I, um, I hate to see what happens when the Empiricist League and the Metaphysical Club tangle with each other. <laughs> it might get ugly. Um, anyway. <laughs> So uh, I'm here to talk about GMOs. Um, and the reason I know about this technology to the extent that I do is that I wrote um, about Monsanto a little while ago. And as I probably don't need to tell anyone, um, Monsanto and GMOs are basically uh, you know, synonymous in the public imagination. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, you know, Monsanto, more than any entity, public, private, individual, corporate, um, has really done more than anything to um, develop, promote, profit from, um, and, and really preach the benefits of, of this technology. Um, and I think uh, one thing I figured out pretty quickly in beginning to do the research is that there's an enormous amount of hype, an enormous amount of hysteria around this technology, um, and a lot of it's not true. So um, I guess one of the things, you know, just getting to know the story of this company and this technology there are um, a couple lessons. Uh, one is that um, usually the you know, most amazing and the most chilling thing that someone tells you about a technology are both wrong. Um, and secondly, um, the potential of a technology, whether it's GMOs or whatever, uh, aren't just a matter of what someone can do in a lab. It's, it's a matter of sort of the culture around it, um, the society, the legal system, the economic system, the religious context. Um, and I think that is something that uh, Monsanto and a lot of GMO proponents have, have learned over the past few decades um, much to their chagrin. So, so what are GMOs? Basically, they are life forms that have been modified in a way that you couldn't do using traditional breeding. Um, usually what that means is you've taken DNA from another species and put it in there. And usually the donor species in the sort of GMOs that are on the market now is a bacteria and the recipient species is a plant. So what we're talking about is plants with bacteria DNA in them. Um, there are some exceptions to that, which I'll hopefully get to later. Um, but that's mostly what we're talking about. Um, and the ability to create this stuff, to make these things, dates back to the early 1980s. Um, a lot of the research was done by Monsanto and by university researchers they were working with. Monsanto um, was pretty aggressive about patenting all this stuff, uh, which ended up ending some of those um, collaborations. Um, but at the time, nonetheless, at the time, there was a lot of pretty optimistic press coverage about the idea that we weren't just going to be creating um, sturdier plants, um, but also healthier ones, uh, that, that we could create um, fruits and vegetables that would have many times the nutritional content of, of ones created through traditional breeding that we would create um, foods that could provide medicines or, um, and, and help end diseases that were killing hundreds of thousands of people in the developing world. Um, the products that ended up coming to market were somewhat more prosaic. Uh, the first one in uh, 1984, I think, was something called the Flavor Saver Tomato. Um, and it was basically a tomato that it had a gene altered so that it didn't get soft uh, when it ripened. So you could pick it when it was ripe and ship it to market, um, and it wouldn't kind of peak and start getting rotten by the time it was on the shelves. It was actually a huge failure, um, but the reason was kind of interesting. Basically, the, the company, Calgene, was full of these incredibly smart uh, scientists, but they didn't really know anything about plants or horticulture, so they had started with these really crappy tomatoes. So you ended up with these long-lasting tomatoes that tasted terrible, um, and nobody bought them. Um, Monsanto kind of got in the game of commercializing stuff pretty quickly, and so a few years later, they brought, they started bringing uh, their own products to market, and these were things that were not focused on supermarket consumers. Um, Monsanto's clients, their customers are farmers. Um, for most of their history, they've been a chemical company. They sold chemicals to lots of people, including farmers. These were mostly things you sprayed on your fields. Um, and so they marketed, they, they developed and marketed two kinds of GMOs. The first um, was, a, was a class of plants called BT plants. Um, and BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a, it's a bacteria. Um, and um, it produces a toxin that kills worms. And it was actually discovered in um, the early 20th century in Japan 
because there was this mysterious and really alarming um, silkworm die-off. And it turned out that it was because of this bacteria. Um, you know, worms are obviously something that are very important to silk producers. They're something that farmers hate. So farmers very quickly started using this um, as a pesticide. And it's actually really popular. Um, it became popular among organic farmers. Um, so Monsanto figured out a way to basically put this in seeds so that the, seed, the plants that they grew into would um, produce pesticides everywhere, the leaves, their roots, their stem, and any caterpillar that was unlucky enough to start chewing on it would just die. Um, that was one thing. The other category are, are herbicide-resistant um, plants. And these are, um, these are crops that, that, that basically are, are immune to herbicides. So this is something that Monsanto had been trying to figure out how to create for a while. Um, it proved hard to find something that actually created this gene. Um, and the way they found it was kind of interesting. They basically um, tried a bunch of stuff, and it turned out that one of the researchers in the sort of GM part of the company was talking to one of the guys who made uh, herbicides. And he said, you know, it's funny, the, um, we've got these factories, we've got these factories that make um, our herbicides, glyphosate in particular, and in the sort of muck around them, we have all this runoff where, where basically the pesticides, the herbicides have basically, f you know, leaked out of the building into the ground. And like in all kind of mud, there's bacteria in there. Um, and they'd been basically like marinating in this stuff for many generations of bacteria, which is not very long because bacteria don't live very long. And so over a pretty quick period of time, natural selection had gone to work and had created these, these bacteria that did this thing that Monsanto had been trying to do for years. So they took that, put it in plants, um, and that's what we now know of as, as Roundup Ready crops. Um, glyphosate is Roundup. It's a popular herbicide. Roundup Ready crops are ones that um, are immune to it. The great thing about that for a farmer is that um, rather than having to kind of spray in this kind of with a variety of sprays at a variety of times to try to kill off the weeds but not kill the crops, um, what you can do is basically wait for everything to start growing and spray the whole field and the crops live and the weeds die. It's sort of like a chemical stencil. Um, so when we talk about GM crops now, that's kind of what we're still talking about, these 30-year-old technologies. Um, and if what we're wondering about is like, is this good for the world? Is it bad for the world? That's what we need to, um, these technologies are what we're kind of curious about. Um, and so are they good for the world? Are they bad for the world? I think it depends on how you ask the question. If what you're asking about is, or is it okay to eat these things? The vast majority of research says it is. Um, and that means research that's not just funded by Monsanto. It means lots of independent researchers looking at this have found that there's no difference between eating genetically modified crops and conventional crops. That doesn't mean that it's not possible to use the technology to, say, introduce an allergen into something. Um, it just hasn't happened. And the argument of a proponent of the technology is that we have safeguards in place to prevent that from happening. Um, the harder question, though, is, is, is this good for the world? You know, how should we feel about this as kind of like citizens of the planet? And that's a, that's a trickier question. Um, having looked at a lot of the research, I feel like on balance, um, the evidence suggests that it's, you can get more yield out of your acres if you're using this stuff. You spray less if you're using this stuff. You can farm in certain ways that preserve the topsoil, which is really good. Um, so right now, you know, I'd say on balance, it's, it's pretty good. The question is, over the longer term, you do start to see some rebound effects. And um, you've seen farmers have to spray more because you have plants developing resistances to the herbicides. You have um, ins insects developing resistances to the pesticide. So over the long term, it's a bit of a more open question. The other question, though, that I have is what happened to all these um, other things that people were talking about when we first were introduced to GMOs? These crops that were going to, you know, produce medicines or, or huge amounts of, of, of um, vitamins or minerals for, for poor people who are starving and dying. That hasn't happened yet. Um, and I think it's interesting to look at why it hasn't happened. Uh, part of the problem is that... Um, it is still on. Um, 
So part of the problem is that people just don't like these things. They don't like eating them. There's a lot of resistance. You see it in the, uh, the current movement around labeling. Um, and so crops that are basically going to be consumed by people are a hard sell. Uh, Monsanto is in the business of making seeds. A lot of those crops are basically things that are um, not consumed by people. Um, most of the commodity crops grown in this country are eaten by animals. They go into your gas tank um, for fuel ethanol. So it's not really, even if the sort of labeling laws came into place and we saw people running you know, for the exits from this technology, you're really not going to see, I mean, for Monsanto, it's still OK, because they can still, they still have this whole business uh, centered around animal feed uh, and ethanol. Um, the other thing, though, is that it's, um, the other reason that public resistance matters is that it makes it much harder for these researchers in, say, universities or nonprofits to do this work. Um, they don't have the kind of deep pockets, and so public resistance, public um, reluctance to, to sort of support this stuff means that they don't look into doing the work on, you know, golden rice or these things that are going to um, get beyond basically making farming more lucrative and more efficient and, and basically trying to create new kinds of exciting foods. Um, but the other part of it really is that um, this is uh, kind of still pretty crude technology. Before I started looking uh, at the issue, uh, I had this image that genetic modification was kind of this very precision thing with people using like, uh, you know, microscopic tweezers or something or scalpels and basically taking little pieces of genetic material and inserting them exactly where they're supposed to go. In reality, it's kind of this real um, blunderbuss kind of approach where you have these things called gene guns, which are basically like, they just like blast particles full of genetic material into seeds or you have these bacteria that are, um, that are basically uh, putting the genetic material wherever in the seeds. So it takes an enormous amount of time and an enormous amount of um, money to make this stuff. And so only really the Monsanto's of the world can do it. And even those guys are only going to do it if they can make a lot of money off of it. So that's why you see things like the BT crops and the herbicide-resistant crops being the only ones that are coming to market. So. Um, So what's happening is actually GMOs have become a bit of um, yesterday's news in a way. You see these companies like, um, you see these big companies, these big research projects getting into forms of breeding that in certain ways are sort of traditional breeding. So it's like taking plants and mixing them together, but it's using kind of lasers and robots and these amazing kind of like Rube Goldberg kind of machines. Um, and so the line between genetic modification and natural sort of breeding has begun to get blurrier and thinner. Um, at the same time, you do have some of these long-running GMO projects finally getting to the stage where, um, where they're beginning to yield stuff. So you have golden rice, which was this, um, which was basically rice that's been genetically engineered to produce a lot of vitamin A. Um, and that deals with the disease that kills hundreds of thousands of kids in uh, a lot of parts of the poor world. You have um, actually the, one of the more interesting projects is not really plants. It's actually uh, mosquitoes. So they've taken, um, they've taken mosquitoes and bred male mosquitoes that basically have um, a gene in them that means that their offspring will die. Uh, and it's creepy, but what it means is that basically um, mosquitoes are vectors for a whole lot of really scary diseases. Mosquitoes are spreading to lots of different parts of the world with climate change. Um, this is something that could actually kind of halt that spread. It's still controversial because, um, because it's creepy. Uh, <laughs> you also have... Uh, projects like the, the citrus greening project, you have um, a disease that's basically killing a lot of orange trees. Um, and what, um, what breeders are trying to do is basically that it's been impossible to create uh, an immunity to this disease through traditional breeding. And so despite the fact that it's kind of um, controversial, you've had these farmers in Florida trying to basically fund projects to genetically engineer citrus trees by uh, I think the genes are, the ones that they're trying are spinach genes, 
a gene from a virus, there's a, a, a pig gene. Um, basically, all these things are showing some promise in basically creating trees that fight off this disease that's otherwise going to decimate um, a lot of orange trees. But I think um, if the question is is, is, is GMOs kind of like the last best hope of the food system, um, I think the answer is that no, it's not. Um, it, it's one of a, an arsenal of tools that we've got. And, um, but it's sort of, it's, it's, it's becoming harder to differentiate between GMO breeding and traditional breeding. And as that happens, I think we'll start to realize that there's a whole bunch of ways in which we uh, play God with nature. It's just that some of those we've decided are kind of scarier um, than others. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.